Okay, so, um, well, great. Thanks for everyone for coming. And um, so tonight we're gonna talk about restorative sleep. And I bring up restorative because for a good reason, really. Um, there's so much going on now um, for all of us, really, around uh, our ability to sleep. And some of us, you know, we spend eight hours in bed or 10 hours in bed, but we wake up feeling exhausted. Um, some of us spend six hours in bed and we wake up feeling exhausted. Um, and so the, it's really about the quality of your sleep, not, not so much the quantity. And we'll speak into that um, as, we, as we go through the evening tonight. So um, many of you may know me, I'm, I run a medical practice called Blue Wave Medicine. We're an integrated medicine practice. We practice um, both primary care concierge medicine as well as second opinion medicine. Um, and we are based at Cavallo Point. I'm fortunate enough to work out of Cavallo Point. It's a beautiful location that many of you have been to. Um, I'm, I also uh, am on the board for the Academy for Integrative Health and Medicine, which is the National Society, in my view, for integrative medicine. Um, has primarily domestic, but also international um, chapters throughout, throughout the globe, uh, with a primary emphasis out of the United States. And, um, this organization or its sort of ancestry organizations from which it came have been around for about 25 years. Um, so um, tonight I'm going to sort of pull in a lot of different information that I have based on the, my integrated medicine orientation. So, you know, tonight will be uh, a conversation where we're, we're talking about the right hand side of this slide here, not the left. Um, and I should say the left, I guess, bullseye. You know, in medical school on the left-hand side, we really learn about medical devices, we learn about medications or drugs, and we learned about surgery. Um, we learn very little about the psychosocial components of health, uh, and we learn very little about complementary and alternative medicine therapies and all the other things that sort of support uh, one in, within an ecosystem of thinking about health and healthcare. Um, so, what uh, I think what's um, important to really keep in mind is there's a much larger view that many of you know um, that's beyond what we are taught in medical school. And I've spent my entire career, um, both before going into medical school and after, um, trying to procure different um, aspects of thinking about how to diagnose things as well as therapeutically. So if you reorient the equation, it's really primarily self-care, not medications, devices, and surgery, but the foundational piece for each one of us to promote our own health is really caring for ourselves, you know, taking good care of ourselves and the lifestyle medicine that we can apply to ourselves. And then beyond that, sometimes we need more help, but that should be the bedrock and foundation from which we stand. So if you're thinking about blood pressure, um, the first thing to think about is your stress levels and your sleep, right? And, and your weight and all those things affect your blood pressure. And sure, you may need medication now, but you really have to foundationally change that piece because that will ultimately help you for most people, not all, but for most, dramatically help their need for medication or the quantity of medication. So beyond that, you know, we may need other things. Let's say massage, for example, in the setting of blood pressure or um, other therapists that might help. Um, whether they're massage therapists, psychotherapists, you know, that, that will help sort of your own capacity for self-healing. And then beyond that, we may need dietary supplements or nutraceuticals or pharmaceuticals, et cetera. So that's the orientation of how we're going to speak to today. And that's the orientation of how we practice or I practice. Um, I love this, this piece of artwork, thinking about sleep and, and the dream world that we all enter in every night. And we don't even really think about it. You know, we take it for granted that we are um, really just filled with the lands of dreams and um, every night. And as uh, Professor Dement uh, likes to say, dreaming permits each and every one of us to be quietly and safely insane every night of our lives. Um, it's really interesting how we spend our time. Some of us, you know, it was half our time or a third of our time uh, sleeping. And yet much of it we don't remember. So the sleep problems are quite uh, prevalent in, in America and, you know, and globally for that matter, um, frequently undiagnosed. Um, and as people get older, they tend to have more and more problems with sleep. And um, we'll speak to that a bit. Um, if you, you know, in a, a survey that was done, 
a while back, but it really hasn't changed. If not, maybe it's gotten a little bit worse, actually. You can see the frequency with which people report having problems with their sleep. Um, you know, 20% saying rarely, 80% saying, yeah, you know, either a few times a month, all the way to, to every evening. And you can see trends over time. The average hours of sleep um, trending from nine a century ago to a little under seven hours uh, in, in, in the year 2000, and it's even less uh, now. So, and we'll talk about this, you know, the thinking being that less than seven to eight hours of sleep really, mo for most people, we accumulate sleep debt. We don't wake up feeling refreshed and then stay refreshed through the day. We often accumulate sleep debt. And what are some of the consequences of that? So we know for ourselves, right? We know our quality of life goes down. We know we're more likely to become depressed or anxious or have different mood issues. Our cognitive performance is impaired. We can be in car accidents, we can be, you know, have injuries. We're just not as crisp and clean. Um, and then at the physiologic level, we know it affects hunger. We know it affects metabolism. We know it leads to obesity, sleep debt, not separate from the cal caloric intake, uh, but the body then thinks it's under sort of survival and stress. And so we're more likely to take calories and convert them to fat. And as a result, increase our weight and in addition, increase our glucose uh, to, um, yeah, intolerance or um, insulin resistance. And a lot of this you can see is, like I mentioned, the stress levels, which we talk about as a sympathetic nervous system or cortisol. And these are responses to us feeling stressed, right? And when that happens, things get diverted and not properly metabolized. So when we think about sleep, um, we really, as we go through the night, actually have more and more REM sleep for most of us. And you can see the different stages of sleep, stages one through four, unrelated to rapid eye movement sleep when, when you're dreaming. And if you think about these sort of separately in different components, um, you've got the non-REM part, so the non-dreaming part, and there's the four stages I mentioned. And this is really the idling brain in a movable body. So the body can move, but you're not actively dreaming. So you may be tossing and turning, um, so that's movable. Um, it's very rare that you're dreaming and or the body is just well designed so that if you're dreaming, you're flying, that you don't get up and go jump out the window, right? So uh, this is 75% of our sleep is a non-REM sleep. And interestingly enough, this is where a lot of um, new neural connections are made, neuroplasticity happens in this deeper stages of non-REM sleep, stage three and four. And also um, human growth factor or human growth hormone is pulsed and really promotes a lot of our immune system and our immune, our own healing. And so of note, many medications that we take, including nutraceuticals, some of them affects this deeper stages, stage three and four of non-REM sleep. So we're, the studies, I haven't seen very clear studies looking at the effect on human growth hormone in these medications um, and on neuroplasticity, but we do know that it does affect those deeper stages of non-REM sleep. So that's important to keep in mind, which is even more of a reason why, as we talk, we talk later, lifestyle and these other self-care uh, reliance on those is far superior and more potent and also has less side effects than taking sleep medication. So as Professor Dement likes to say, it's, the REM sleep is an active, hallucinating brain in a paralyzed body. Thank goodness. Yeah. Um, I can remember as a child having lucid dreams, and there's a book about lucid dreams, where you're awake in your dream, you, you know that you're dreaming and you're cognizant that this is a dream. I don't know if that's ever happened to any of you. And you'll know if you try to move, your, your body's paralyzed. And I can remember trying to wake myself out of a dream that was not a pleasant dream and really trying to literally, it was like a Herculean effort to try and roll over to wake myself up out of the dream. I don't know if that's ever happened to anyone here. So the, that piece, you know, lucid dreaming is quite interesting being aware while you're dreaming. So being the witness, bearing witness to your dreams and being able to direct those dreams or interpret those dreams as well, but that's another conversation for a different evening. So um, what is insomnia? What is sleep disturbance? It can be problems getting to sleep. It can be problems staying asleep. 
it can be um, sort of the early morning wakening. So you, you wake up at 4 a.m. and you can't get back to sleep. And also uh, awakening and not feeling rested is a form of insomnia because that sort of predicts that something's happening during the evening time. Even if you're quote asleep the whole time, maybe you have sleep obstruct, let's say you have obstructive sleep apnea. So um, what kind of conditions actually can sort of be um, hidden that are actually causing this? And you think, oh, it's just you, but actually you have a medical issue that's causing the problem. Most typically what we think about is, like I mentioned, sleep uh, apnea, so obstructive sleep apnea, that can cause disrupted sleep because you every as you go into a deeper stages of sleep, your, let's say, for example, the upper palate, for example, softens, and then it blocks the airway, and then you can't breathe, and you have it, you stop breathing, it's apneic, apnea, and then it wakes you up. So you keep dropping out of the deeper sleep moment, so you never get that full rest. Hyperthyroidism is another example, because if you're hyperthyroid, you have an active metabolism, you're actively stimulated, and you disrupt sleep, as, as well as some of these other problems. Arthritis, for example, is really related to pain. So a lot of people have pain. And then because of that pain, they can't sleep and other pain conditions um, that disrupt sleep. Also drugs and medications and, um, and recreational drugs. So alcohol being a recreational drug, um, stimulants, obviously, if you're, you know, people are taking stimulants for um, ADHD, for example, or recreational stimulants, that'll keep people up. Um, thyroid hormones, if people are over repl replenished with thyroid hormones, um, nicotine can do the same. And certain foods that have caffeine in it, for example, such as chocolates, obviously coffee, um, decongestions, a range of these can actually disrupt sleep. So let's, you know, what do we do as, as clinicians? We really, uh, most Docs don't spend a lot of time unless they're sleep specialists or integrated medicine, sort of holistic oriented physicians, clinicians on the first piece, which is the most important piece, which is lifestyle, habits. Those, that is the main sort of thrust. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier this evening. And we'll talk about that uh, in, in a few moments. Then medication history for the reasons I just mentioned. We do a basic exam too, you know, looking for thyroid abnormalities, for example, a heart lung exam to look at some of the medical problems that could be associated with things that are underlying this issue. Um, and then laboratory testing for the reason I mentioned. Um, so thyroid function being really one of the more important ones. Hematocrit we would do if someone has anemic and they're exhausted and, and we think they're having sleep problems, but it turns out, for example, they have low, low blood counts. Um, so, and then now, what are the other pieces that are worth thinking about? So there's been some interesting research and looking at sleep, sleep deprivation. And they took folks that were teenagers, um, right? So roughly about seventh grade through high school, um, 4,000 of them, and they followed them for a year. And they found that, um, so sleep less than six hours at baseline, they found predicted subsequent depression a year later. Um, and further sleep deprivation uh, after controlling for baseline depression. So what this is saying is that the data suggests that a reduced quantity of sleep increases the risk for major depression, which in turn increases your risk of uh, decreased sleep further. So if you're not sleeping a lot, it can increase your risk of becoming depressed. And then once you're depressed, you have more problems having high quality sleep. So that further decreases your ability to sleep. So it becomes this positive feedback loop in, in a negative way. Um, so that was very interesting, right? So, oh, what's the big deal? I can live, you know, have a great time and not sleep a lot. The risk is it actually, it's actually a twofold increased risk of becoming depressed. And then once you're depressed, you're, it's more challenging for you actually to get a good quality sleep. There's another study looking at telomeres and, and telomeres is really that signature to look at the aging of a cell. And they found that telomere length was associated with sleep duration amongst folks with HIV is this one population they looked at. And basically what they found is those that slept seven, more than seven hours a night had longer telomeres, which meant their age, the cellular age was younger compared to those that 
didn't sleep as much, less than seven hours. And that's after controlling for a lot of factors. So anxiety, sleep, sleep quality, et cetera. Um, so they found independently that basically what this is telling us is that sleep and the amount of quality, the quality and quantity of your sleep is correlated with this actually aging process. So if you've ever seen folks under high stress have been, you know, look at a president and pretty much any president in the United States that you've seen how quickly they age in part stress and in part how little they sleep because they're working so much. So how, how about circadian rhythm? And there's some great books looking at this. There's a book, great book called The Circadian Code that I recommend people consider looking at, um, listening to or reading. Um, and what they found here is that eveningness is highly correlated with poor quality sleep and subsequent risk of depression. And what I mean by that is going to sleep later versus earlier. So in this study, they had a cohort of patients with major depression and they were assessed for their chronotype. So, are they, did they, um, are they morning sort of, you know, wake up early in the morning or do they sleep late? And the, the, the precursor to that obviously is do they go to sleep earlier or do they go to sleep late? And what they did is they had 253 people um, and they, it was mostly women and they had folks in the equally distributed between the morningness, the eveningness, and then the, the, the bulk were in the intermediate phase. Um, and they had, what did they find? They found that they had higher insomnia severity and more severe depression and higher suicidality in those that were the evening type, which meant basically going to sleep after 2 a.m. And it was associated with non-remission of depression. They were three times more likely to be depressed and had that depression persist than those that were the morning folks. Insomnia was an independent risk factor contributing to this non-remission, you could see here. So um, what they found is there was an independent association of going to sleep really late, past 2 a.m., if that was your basic chronotype that you tend to do that, with non-remission, meaning sort of persistent depression, um, and suggesting a, a significant underpinning of circadian rhythm in major depression. And they talk about the need for a comprehensive assessment of sleep and circadian disturbances. So it's really important to think about uh, for those that have kids that stay up late and, the, and that are prone to mood disorders and poor quality sleep and those adults that also tend to be you know, evening dwellers rather than morning dwellers. If you could shift it even just by two hours to you know, midnight or before midnight, it really dramatically improves um, or reduces your risk. So what about aging in general? As I mentioned early on, sleep disturbances increase with age. Um, and we notice that people have less total sleep time. There's all just changes in the circadian, in the, in the architecture of your sleep. So there's less sleep per night, less deep sleep, the stages I talked about earlier, stage three and four. And um, it tends to take longer for people to get to sleep. And so there's more fatigue and you know, more daytime napping. So, um, you know, how bad is it? Well, you can see in the elderly, there's a greater than 50% of the people report sleep problems. It's more common in women than men. Um, it can be often secondary or pr another primary sleep disorder like sleep apnea and the, the other things I, I mentioned like that. And commonly associated with psychiatric disorders or depression, meaning that, and in this, it's, it could be the chicken or the egg, right? So I'm depressed, so I have sleep disturbances or I'm anxious, I have sleep disturbance or I have sleep disturbance, which then increases your risk of depression, which then, as I mentioned earlier, increases your risk there. So what can we do about it? I'm gonna spend a fair amount of time around the, the non-drug options um, because those are, I think are most relevant and they empower us to be able to do it within our own scope. We don't need someone outside ourselves to do a lot of these things. Um, so um, here's my sort of thumbnail sketch on tips. Okay, if you're gonna take home one thing, this one slide sums up a lot of what I want to talk about, which is creating a bedtime routine, meaning bedtime, regular bedtime schedule and a routine. So there's a routine that you do before you go to bed every night. Why? It's like Pavlov's dog. You want to set up a cue and then you get the response or the reward. The reward is sleep. So the cue is I light a candle or I put on a, a certain type of music or I make myself chamomile tea 
or I give myself a massage on, on my feet or I, I soak in a nice bath, whatever it is for you, that can become your cue so that you know that I'm getting into sleep mode. Um, secondly, as a schedule, you need to be, we need to be consistent. The more consistent you are when you go to sleep and wake up, the more likely you'll be able to have a better quality sleep during the time that you are asleep. I recommend as part of this routine is actually setting your alarm. So I actually, you know, on the iPhone now, and I'm, I'm sure it's on some of the other phones as well, you can actually set a time for when you want to start getting ready for bed. So there, there are settings in here for you to say, uh, I want to prompt when, I, you know, so for mine, my prompt is at 9.45. And that it, it, a little thing goes ding and it says time to get ready for bed. And I get, I gave myself 45 minutes. I've actually moved it back now to 9.30. So, um, and that tells me, okay, shut down my screen, shut off my television or my computer or whatever I'm doing. And I change mode. I get on, if I'm dressed in clothes, like work clothes, I get into my PJs, you know, into my sort of sleeping gear. Um, I start, you know, for me, I don't draw a bath, but you know, I know lots of people that do. So, but for me, I roll out my yoga mat. I do a little bit of yoga. I may do a little meditation. I may read a little bit. I may journal a little bit. And I just turn down all the lights. That's the first thing I do actually, is turn down all the lights because lighting is very stimulating. Um, and, for, so, and set your environment, your home environment. Windows open so it's cooler. Um, windows closed if you like it warmer, whatever it is for you that you need to set up the environment. But lighting's a big piece. We're so visually oriented and so is sound. Um, so for those that need sleeping, you know, covers, eye covers, those should be near your bed. Earplugs, if you need those, you know, turning your clock away so it's not shining light. Where does the phone belong? So you should go immediately if you don't have a, a, your own clock separate from your phone. You, the first thing you should do tomorrow morning or tonight online is buy yourself a cheap alarm clock or just cheap clock um, to put by your bedside. So you not, don't rely on this thing, which I call a portal, which is basically a small computer um, where you can do everything with. So indulging relaxation techniques, I just sort of went through that. Journaling, it can be really interesting because in the morning you can jot things down as well, or in the middle of the night, if you wake up for thoughts, it's a place to put things so that you don't have to think about them anymore. So what do you want to avoid? As many of you probably know by now, blue LED lights are thought to reduce melatonin by 50% and they last for about, it's for not up to 90 minutes. So um, nowadays, a lot of screens will change their, the color of what's coming out, not television so much, but computers and phones. Um, if you set the setting that way, it'll start turning more and more what looks like a yellow color. Um, and that's because these blue LED, LED lighting is affecting your melatonin levels. So the, the goal is to try and change that. There's also filters. You can wear, you can wear eye shade filters. You can put screens up um, or you can just shut off the darn screen in the first place. So uh, environmental stimulants, um, the most relevant one is emotionally charged conversations, right? Whether that's coming out of your television set because you're watching, you know, Vikings, um, or it's coming from your between you and your whoever you live with, you know, roommates, spouses, family members, or it's you're online in your in your inbox doing work. But that is by far the most relevant thing that should be shut down as soon as possible to give yourself, and then you insert something in there to change your mode. So I often will. Um, I remember one night I I was pretty intense. I was watching a show, I think it was like a Viking show. And I knew there was no way I was going to be able to get to sleep easily, which is rare for me, but I could just sense it. I was so stimulated. Um, and so I immediately had to do something to change my attention. So I, you know, picked up a book and read for a bit. And, um, and that, you know, dropped me in a whole different world. And then I was able to then transition to my evening routine to go to sleep. Really important to do that. Don't deny yourself that sort of, if you feel that, listen to it and act on it. Don't just say, I'll be fine, turn off the lights and next thing you know, you, you know, Vikings part two showing up on my internal screen in my brain, right? Um, so screens and devices we just spoke about. And then stimulants, people don't realize this, but uh, caffeine, 
it's hidden in lots of different things, eating too late at night, as well as alcohol. So, you know, when we eat too late at night and we have a full stomach, a lot guaranteed sleep disruption. And I, by the way, I recommend if you're interested to get some wearable devices, they're not all very, you know, outstanding, but it's worth, they do a pretty good job giving you a, a pretty good sense of, A, when are you sort of getting into bed and getting out of bed? Hopefully within that rain, they understand when you fall asleep and wake up. Um, I had an aura ring for quite some time and I've got another one now because my battery died on the first one, but um, it was doing quite well. And then it, it would show me waking up and it would like show these quick wake ups. And I don't remember waking up at all. And it might've been me tossing and turning. There's better ones. There's like something called bed it. Um, and there's a few other thing, uh, ones out there that will track your sleep. And I recommend you do that. You know, it's interesting to note how long are you in bed for? It starts to bring you to be mindful of how long am I in, in the bed for? How long am I sleeping for while I'm in bed? And what happens to me when I drink alcohol? So for example, I know that when I drank alcohol, my heart rate very, my heart rate went up through the entire evening, way higher, 10, 15 points higher. I'm normally, normally in the high forties. I'd be in the, for a good part of the first heart part of the evening, I'd be in the low sixties, strikingly different. Um, and also I had more awakenings. Same with being on a full stomach, I would have more awakenings and be more uncomfortable because there's more gas formation, you're not digesting your food right, et cetera. Um, so I would run these experiments. And the other is, as I mentioned, eye shades and setting up the environment for use to maximize your ability to not be interrupted or woken up um, by external factors, right? Light, sound, temperature, these are all relevant. The other piece is that darn phone, which is, I don't, is really not a phone, but a, a computer. Um, the, keeping that near your bed is, the, it could, there couldn't be a more uh, destructive element to the quality of your sleep than having your phone near your bed. And many of you know the reason why. Um, now there's ways to do it differently. You could have it on airplane mode um, you could turn off our notifications, even the ones that run internally, even on airplane mode. So you could set it up so that it, you can use it for, you know, guided meditation if it's on your app, uh, on their phone as an app, or other sorts of uh, programming that helps you sleep. Maybe you're reading, but my suggestion is to use a different device if you can, and use it for that purpose. To ideally compartmentalize what device you use, what things for. And since most of us use our phone for a range of things, I recommend people use a tablet instead, for example, and put the app on that tablet um, or um, for meditation, for example, or for reading so that they're not tempted to then go check their inbox or go browse something online or see this recent news thing that popped up. There's so much coming through the phone. So what about the mind? So, this is, um, so there's stimulus control, which we were just talking about. And then there's really focusing the mind in relaxation practices. And in thinking about these practices, um, what comes to mind is really starting to be able to separate you from your thoughts, you from your emotions. And quite, Frequently, what happens is you are your emotions and your thoughts. And so you, you don't even realize that your mind is just running with them. And we've spoken about this before. Some of you participated in my talks where I speak about the default mode network, which is a neural network in the brain that um, runs when we're worrying, when we're thinking, when we're you know, worrying, ruminating, it's regarding sort of safety and, and, and um, sort of check to check and balance where you're scouring the landscape, external stimuli, looking, ensuring things are safety, and then you come back. That's teleologically what we think it's come from. And that sort of surveillance, if you will, ongoing, ongoing in repetitive fashion to a point where you don't even realize you're doing it. It's almost like you split off and you sort of quote space out, but your mind is just on this loop. And it's an automated loop. It just keeps going. 
And only just when you bring your attention to it, do you realize, oh my gosh, I've been thinking like this thing all over and over and over. And when that's happening, you, if you're trying to go to sleep, you won't go to sleep. Um, and you don't understand why. And then you realize you've been thinking about something you don't know how many times. It's almost similar to if you've ever been driving and you're, you just don't remember the last 10 minutes of your drive back to the house. Like you remembered like getting off off ramp, but then the rest of the way you were thinking and you just somehow made it home. It's that sort of lack of awareness. And so um, that situation actually is quite harmful for our quality of our sleep. How do you circumvent it? How do you sort of grow some habits that will prevent to diminish the frequency with which or duration with which you're in that default mode network? And meditation is really, or, or any sort of awareness practice uh and contemplative practice really allows you to go towards that place so what well, i suggest why don't we spend a few minutes we have some time tonight so why don't, i'm going to pause the slides here and let's do a brief uh, awareness practice here meditation so if you're feeling if you can if you're able please i encourage you to sit up it's much more challenging to to do when you're uh, lying flat um, and I encourage you to sit, um, get in a comfortable position. It could be on the floor, it could be on a chair, a couch. Um, if you have the ability to sit and move forward a little bit so that you're a little bit off from the back of the chair, so you can support yourself in the chair and um, allow, allow yourself to be so that you're not ideally not slumped over. You don't really want your shoulders and, and, and spine slumped over. You, you want to be a bit vertical and um, so that'd be ideal. Sometimes it's easier to do that if you move towards the edge of the chair or couch that you're on to allow yourself to, to rock that pelvis forward into the neutral position rather than back and that which requires, which leads to a humping of the back to sort of compensate so you don't fall backwards. So people tend to come forward. So by coming up a little bit, I'm able to sit comfortably. And then uh, it's often easier to close your eyes and if that's comfortable for you, allow your feet to be nicely comfortably planted on the ground if you're able. Um, your sit bones would be nicely positioned so you can feel them pushing up against or being pushed up against the, whatever you're sitting on. With that pelvic pelvis just in a neutral position and your spine erect. And your hands can be comfortable um, either on both leg, the hand on each leg Often you can allow the hands to face upward towards the sky, or you can bring them together sort of in a, a position like this. And just sit comfortably like that for a moment with your eyes closed and just notice your breath. Just bring some awareness to the breath. Don't, you don't need to change your breath, but just notice your breath. I don't know about you, but I've had many thoughts just be running through my head while I'm talking to you right now. And so I'm just noticing that and then I'm allowing myself to, I could beat myself up about it. I could say, well, I'm leading a, a webinar here and how could I allow myself to be thinking about other things or having a com com running commentary in my head about how well or not well I'm doing leading this webinar. But instead, I'm just going to allow all that, even if that happens too, and then bring myself back to my breath. Starting anew, starting fresh as if I'm starting over again, just back to the breath. And one way you can sort of demarcate that is by counting your breath. It's a simple way. So every breath I count is one and you can just count the first breath is one in and out, second breath is two. And if then I start thinking, and then I realize I'm thinking, when I notice I'm thinking and I come back to my breath again, I just start over back to one again. So I have a way to say I'm starting refreshing, starting over.
A lot of times with meditation, many people think you should clear your mind. And if you can't clear your mind, it's frustrating and you'll never get there. And the truth is after speaking and working with many very senior teachers is the goal isn't to have a clear mind per se, and that can be maybe never happen. The intention is to simply notice, gain awareness of when you're thinking and coming back to your breath. Every time you're thinking, you, the moment you notice it, to come back to your breath. It's not to stop the thinking. This is to notice when you are. And the goal there is to then be able, in that process, you will separate you from your thinking and you from your feelings as they rise up and fall. And in that separation gives you the power, the ability to choose how you want to react, to choose if you want to behave that way, if you want to believe that thought, if you want to feel that emotion, rather than being pulled by it, you now are, have the choice. So coming back to your breath, And when you're ready, I'd like you just to notice in your body, if you notice any tension anywhere, and bring your attention toward that tension. Breathing in to that tension, allowing healing energy to come into that space and then exhaling, letting go, releasing some of that tension and using your breath to come in again. And then exhaling. If you're touching areas of pain or discomfort some of you may have gone through surgery recently. Some of you may have chronic or acute discomfort. Just breathing fresh, clean air, the nourishment of the oxygen and all the new vital energy that comes in, coming into that space and then exhaling, allowing the debris, the toxins, the residual to disperse out. And then just repeat. These sorts of practices allow you to choose where you bring your attention. I'm choosing to bring it to this area. I'm choosing to notice when I'm feeling or when I'm thinking. And by directing your attention, it gives you the skill to learn to do that rather than just being in automatic mode. So coming back to the room again, thank you for that. I hope that was restful for you and not making you too sleepy. Um, what I'd like to, sh to do is to sh speak to um, our ability to, um, let me make sure you're seeing the right screen. So um, this, we've done a bit of the focused mind piece, directing your attention and then the um, <clears throat> relaxation practice. Um, so now I wanna talk about cognitive behavioral therapy a bit. And please let me know if this, I think you can see the screen, but please let me know if you're having trouble seeing that screen. The cognitive behavioral therapy is quite interesting because it's 
what it's doing is that existing, when I talked about the default mode network, when we have these thoughts that are running, what can happen is that we can then not be aware and not, and not know how to stop it. So how do you stop the thinking? So cognitive behavioral therapy is quite good at this. They also give you some other practical exercises like you know getting out of bed during waking periods and which I have a different version on which I'll tell you about in a moment. Avoiding eating as I talked about and reading and watching TV in bed. This is all about conditioning. Eliminate daytime napping, which I have mixed feelings about. For some people that's helpful, for some people it's not helpful. Um, but, the, but clearly <clears throat> both cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness practices and something called mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which is combining these two practices, mindfulness-based stress reduction or mindfulness meditation, combining with cognitive behavioral therapy into one eight-week course, has been more potent or as, as good as sleeping medication. And I'll show you some data on that. But the intention here is to, blow, is to short circuit the loop. That's what we're trying to do. We're short circuiting. Cognitive behavior therapy helps us short circuit the harmful thinking, the critic that's saying, you know, I'm not a good presenter. I'm not good at what I'm doing. I think I know what I'm saying, but I really don't. All that, or I'm the imposter, or I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to speak, the in, insecure, all those different pieces, all those different parts of us. It's learning to A, become aware of it. That's the mindfulness part. Oh, I wasn't aware that I was thinking that way. I wasn't aware that that part of me, there was a part of me that's a critic. I didn't know that. Now I do, I'm aware. Now it's how do I short circuit that so it doesn't keep speaking or I can allow it to speak, but I can actually then speak to it and say, you know, thank you. You served me well when I was a kid and you, you, you know, you helped me speak boldly to the bully, but now I'm a grown up and I don't need you to speak so loudly anymore. Thank you. You know, that sort of dialogue to allow it to sort of go into its own space and not be so dominant. Um, so what does that look like? Um, part of the, the just just think about the you know another way to explain this sort of ruminating part is another way just descriptively like graphically to explain this to you is to show this graph which um, shows that folks that are challenged and then what happens during recovery the pe blue people keep experiencing that challenge and the red people actually the challenge goes away and they move on they're back into they stay in the present moment. The green people never even respond to the challenge in the first place. So they got eaten by the lion. So you don't want to be the green person. <laughs> um, so your, your goal is to be someone that can move on as, and stay in the present moment, which is the red. Um, so how do these services, these, these therapies, these uh, programs work? So this one study looked at folks that were chronic insomniacs. It was a randomized controlled trial, RCT. It published in JAMA, 46 people, and they found that cognitive behavioral therapy was better than, um, sup there was uh, a short and, uh, I would say this, cognitive behavioral therapy was better than sleeping medication, both in short-term and long-term outcomes, which was quite, quite amazing. Um, there is, this study then sort of followed up on that study that looked at cognitive behavioral therapy um, for insomnia enhances depression's outcomes for patients with major depression and, and insomnia. So what they did here is they gave people um, medication, Lexapro, plus cognitive behavioral therapy versus the control group, which was just the Lexapro. And what they found, they found that they had, those that got cognitive behavioral therapy and Lexapro had 61% remission in their depression versus just the Lexapro alone which is 33%, which by the way, as many of you may know, the placebo effect is around 33%. So how effective these SSRIs are for depression is controversial. And I, in my personal experience with patients, I think uh, for some people they are quite effective and for others, they aren't very helpful. But if you see here, cognitive behavior therapy plus Lexapro had twice, almost twice the benefit. And then what about sleep disturbance? The combination of adding cognitive behavioral therapy to your medication, Lexapro, which is good for depression and anxiety, by the way, had a 50% remission versus 7% remission with just Lexapro alone. 
So if you had Lexapro, you had sleep problems, you had mood disorder, depression, only 7% of people got a benefit in their sleep versus half the people taking it if they got cognitive behavioral therapy as well. Also, there were larger improvements in all the diary and the actigraphy, which are like, is basically movement measures of sleep, except for total sleep time. So what they found here is people weren't necessarily sleeping longer. They weren't in bed longer. It was the quality of their sleep was better. So, you know, the, particularly in the Bay Area where time is of the essence, you're not spending more time in bed. You're simply having higher quality sleep while you're in bed. So that, there can be nothing more potent than that and more efficient. There was an, another study that similarly showed cognitive behavioral therapy for depression and insomnia. 87% who had a remission in their insomnia also had depression remission as well. And they were twice as likely to, as I mentioned earlier, to become depressed if they had insomnia. And these results were comparable to the earlier study I showed, the 2008 study. And so what they found here is amazing that 87% who had remission in their insomnia then got remission in their depression as well. So thinking about mindfulness, what are we talking about for a moment, just to speak to that, is that you have beta waves, alpha waves, theta waves, gamma waves. And, and um, basically when you have a lot of activity, like you know, you're interacting, you're walking through the world, you're in beta mode. And theta is sort of sleep, um, alpha and theta. So meditation you get into when you're in the alpha phases. Deep meditators can go into gamma um, and and this very calming phases, right? These alpha, theta, and gamma phases. And there's different devices you can use to sort of as neurobiofeedback tools. Here's one example of one called the Muse, which helps people learn to drop into the more calming states. And it can tell what state you're in. So it's a headset that you wear, as you can see on this picture. And it, there's an app on your phone and it, there's different versions of it. There can be, you know, um, it can be like, uh, you can be in a forest, for example, and, and there can be, if your mind's thinking and you're in that mode, beta mode, and you're thinking, 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 it knows you're thinking. And so it'll start raining really loud. And it starts raining so loud that it distracts your thinking and then brings you back to your meditation that you're supposed to be focused on. And then as you, as that happens, all the rain starts dying down. And then all of a sudden you can hear the leaves and now you can hear the birds chirping and things start shifting much more sort of as positive reinforcement. So it's a really great tool at this neurobiofeedback tool. Um, a lot of folks also have issues with snoring and that wakes them up or they're calling, you know, they're, they're whoever they're sleeping with in their beds waking them up. This is a fun tool to use. Um, it's basically it inflates. If you're snoring, it feels the vibration and it then will inflate. Um, and that will sort of lift people up. So it changes their position in the bed and so that their snoring improves. Um, for some people it may help them with their sleep apnea if they have it, if they have, in addition to if they need a machine, but um, this can really help um, your partner if you're someone that has a partner who's snoring. Um, and then what about the snoring app? So um, some people you know, are saying, do I snore? I don't know if I snore. You claim I snore. I don't think I snore. There's some great apps. This one's on your phone. Again, you would have to like, again, if you're gonna use your phone or, not, or tablet, just turn off everything else around it so you're not prompted by those things. But this will record through sound your snoring and how loud from quiet to light all the way to epic and how frequent. And I, you'll see, uh, I've had several people that were big snorers get the, that, the, get the um, smart Nora, and then their snoring gets much improved. And also I've seen people that, um, that did mindfulness meditation and other practices that we just went through, and both the snoring improves with the, snor the smart Nora as well, and also in their quality of their sleep. So these can all be really helpful tools. Um, and back to wearables, I think it's really helpful. Again, you can sort of hook these all up. Some people that have deoxygenate, they have these, um, they get hypoxic while they're sleeping related to snoring or indoor sleep apnea. And that can be measured as well. Now there's these O2 saturation rings that you can buy and you can check that. For some people I've had patients who by changing their diet, they have different amount of mucus, for example, dairy, and now their snoring improves and their sleep quality improves as well because they cut out dairy. So there's lots of ways to, to measure things, both through your own personal experience as well as using wearable devices as well.
So let's talk a little, little bit about supplements as we come to a close. Um, there's a lot of different supplements out there, a lot of different companies selling different supplements um, focused on remedies and solutions. I just want to emphasize to you that the vast majority of what you need to do for the long term is all the stuff we just talked about. And in the short term, to get yourself so you have better sleep, so you have the you know motivation and ability and inspiration to do all the things I'm talking about. Sometimes we need sleep medications or something like herbs and, and supplements. So these are great ones: hops, lavender, valerian. They come in different. You've seen that different sleep formulas by Gaia, for example. They make a, they make a great product. There's lots of good ones out there. Um, melatonin, a lot of people have used which also, by the way, is helpful for reflux, typically at a dose of three milligrams. It's also been thought to be potentially helpful in, in your immune response related to COVID, although that's not well studied, but that's at a higher dose of six milligrams. Um, and the valerian you can do as, in, as a tea, but you can also do as a pill or in other ways. And ideally you get it in a standardized fashion. In this case, for example, with 0.3% valerianic acid. Um, there's also 5-HTP, a 5-hydroxytryptophan that people use as a precursor to serotonin that people have found beneficial. There's a full range of different nutraceuticals and herbs that come in handy. A traditional Medicinals is a great uh, company if you're looking for different teas uh, to help for a variety of conditions and health issues, whether it's constipation or whether it's a liver detox or whether it's for sleep. Um, because they dose actually the, 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 um, the package of herbs is actually a, a medicinal dose, not just a dose high enough for, you know, your palate, but it's actually for medicinal purposes, traditional medicinals. And so um, I highly recommend them. So this is an example of a Gaia products, you know, what's in it, passion flower, valerian root, and a proprietary blend of lemon balm, um, California poppy, lavender flowers. So you can see there's a range out there. Uh, we really like this product called uh, by Zymogen, called Cortisol, um, which also has a variety of different components in it. Um, what about marijuana? A lot of people have been using marijuana for to help with sleep with great success. Um, some people just need the CBD component, you know, usually you can't, usually it's a 20 to one or, you know, somewhere between eight to one up to 20 to one CBD to THC. And those are not psychologically active, meaning that you don't get high from it. If it's a CBD at that ratio, when it's 20 parts or even eight parts to one part. So think about it just by, by weight, it would be typically eight milligrams of CBD with one milligram of THC. And you would take that. And for many people that's sufficient. Some people need a little bit more THC, typically the more indica body-based versus the sativa type. It's more, a little more heavy and it makes me feel more sleepy. Um, and in that case, people start with as low as 2.5 milligrams of the THC upward to five or 10 milligrams, depending on what people's tolerance is. I typically tell people to start at a very low dose. Um, this is a picture of a whole bunch of sativas you can see there, that is not for sleep. Um, so the CBD, uh, so some people get 50-50, so they get a one-to-one -one ratio of CBD to THC. And they come in tinctures, they come in pills and gummies, or you can sm smoke it. There's so many ways to do it. They come in dissolvable lozenges, um, and I recommend people, if they're taking Ambien in order to sleep, I recommend they try something like this because this is far better than taking Ambien regularly or benzodiazepines of some sort like Ativan or Xanax that people use for sleep. Um, some people can't handle the psychoactive components, so I recommend they just do the CBD alone. Um, and you, you know, there's all sorts, as you can see here, all sorts of comes in drinks and comes in everything you can think of. Um, Medications, uh, just to end on this conversation a bit about medications. Uh, there's a reason why I have this, this slide up and that says this to remind me to tell you that the world knows or the pharmaceutical industry knows that we have a problem sleeping. It's the largest um, budget allocation for the direct-to-consumer advertising is for sleep. 
Um, so, uh, and there's a good reason for it. Um, so medications, you know, the problem with, uh, benzo with Benadryl, which people use for sleep, for example, and uh, some other medications that they affect actually long-term memory. Um, so the concern is that we actually increase your risk for Alzheimer's for certain sleep medications. Um, now, certain sleep medications are good if, if you have the right indication. You know, if you're depressed, then it can help. And you happen to get a sedating medication for your depression, that's sort of a two for one. For example, trazodone is an example of that. Um, uh, but I, I wouldn't suggest, for example, regular ben benzodiazepines, as I mentioned before. They suppress the non-REM and REM stages of sleep. They're addictive. Uh, they're, they're, people go through withdrawals when they're on them. Um, and as I mentioned, antihistamines like Benadryl, for example, can lead to long-term cognitive dysfunction. Used episodically, I think it's fine, but regularly is a problem. So um, some people love, you know, Lunesta and Ambien, but again, the problems with these is, is as many of you have known, is that people can, uh, it's not as good as we think it is. You know, it's questionable whether you preserve your REM sleep uh, and whether there's less withdrawal and less abuse potential. That's how it was promoted, but people have mixed experiences when it comes to that. Um, it is shorter acting. People too, tend to wake up better, but so I think episodic use is fine but regular use is a bit concerning. And people often don't remember. So they have this amnesia that can actually be just before taking the medication all the way to with the medication being off. You, I'm sure you've heard the stories of people walking around naked in the streets, people like eating food, not remembering it, different things happening as an anticipated side effect. So the good news is the uh, sleep, uh, meaning it's good because you're not the only one that sleep disturbances are common. Um, and uh, drugs are well over, are way overutilized in my view and overprescribed and the non-drug treatment options are far superior. Um, and I really encourage you, which is why I spend so much time. Speaking of that, I wanted to let you know, a colleague of mine um, is running a online course. She, she runs, um, she does one-on-one -on -one meditation, um, which you can do uh, through Kavala Point. Um, and she also runs these online courses. And so um, on my website, if you're interested, um, there you'll see there's a button that you can click on when you come to the homepage and she'll be offering two different courses if you're interested. Um, one called Unplug from a Busy Mind. Um, and these courses she's run through Stanford as well for their staff uh, and faculty. Um, and I, I'm glad to see that she's offering to the public. So I'm helping her get that, get the word out. If you know folks that are interested, just direct them to my website where they can sign up for this one or Meditations for Inner Peace and Sustained Resilience, which is starting in May. Um, well, great. Thank you for everyone's time. It's, I'm a little bit running over. I'll look here for briefly to see if there's any questions I can answer. For those that need to go, I fully understand. Um, but let's see here if there's any questions that I can answer. Um, so I, I spoke to uh, the cannabis question. So um, Rick, I'm glad we, we handled that one. Um, and um, I don't have a problem sleeping when I get to bed. The challenge is getting to bed, right? So um, I regularly sleep about six hours a night. Is the sleep a problem? Right, so it's hard for me to know the answer to that question that you're putting forth there. Um, I don't have a problem sleeping when I get to bed. The challenge is getting to, the challenge is getting to bed. I'm not sure I fully understand what you mean. But um, most people, uh, the issues are, is the running mind. Um, and if people sleep five hours and that's all they need and they wake up feeling refreshed, then there's not a sleep problem. If people take a while to get to sleep or are having trouble, they keep waking up through the night. Tip, and a lot of people say to me, I'm not thinking about anything. Once they start spending more and more time with it, they do realize that they are thinking about that there is stuff running in the background. And I often tell people to, if they start meditating, they'll notice that. If they start journaling, they'll, they'll, actually, they'll actually notice. Um, how to increase deep sleep and how much is minimum to get each night? So it's interesting. Uh, it's a good question. How to increase deep sleep um, and how, how much is minimum? 
um, you know, ideally getting an hour to an hour and a half of deep sleep um, is what you're shooting for as a minimum. And um, mo I would experiment. There's no clear answer to how you get deep sleep. Uh, I've, I've had people have different experiences in part by changing what they eat, in part, you know, definitely by avoiding alcohol um, improves your deep sleep, in part by actually meditating and doing yoga prior to bed, which is what I do regularly before going to bed is yoga um, because it helps deep, relax the body and the mind. So I sleep much more deeply, um, can, can actually promote it. You'll notice certain food groups. If some people have issues with gluten or if they have issues with uh, dairy because they get congestion, et cetera, it'll actually change for different reasons. It would change their deep sleep. Uh, thanks for asking that question, Carla. Are my planning to do these uh, seminars in person again soon? Um, I am planning to return to doing these seminars again. Um, the question about soon is to be determined. I think once most of us can be vaccinated, I would anticipate, you know, sometime midsummer, um, then I'll come back to doing these again at Kabbalah Point and, and as well as running them in a webinar format. So those that uh, don't want to travel or can't travel because it's too far can, can participate. Thank you for those, those great questions. Um, a few other questions that came out. Um, can you send a recording to your mother? Um, so this will be posted on my YouTube channel. If you're interested in uh, watching it again or sending it to friends, feel free to go to the YouTube channel. It's, it's simply Dr. Brad Jacobs, DR for Dr. Brad Jacobs uh, on YouTube. Um, and um, what can be done to help sleeping with tinnitus? Uh, it's a good question. Um, using a white noise machine, which I should have mentioned earlier in general, helps with audio stimuli. People will use you know, earplugs, but actually having a white, in your situation, you want some competing sound. So earplugs actually wouldn't serve you well. You want competing sound. So I would use a white noise machine to help compete with that sound. And tinnitus gets much worse at night because everything quiets down, right? So the white noise machine provides some of that. Yeah, thoughts on GABA. GABA can be quite helpful. I presume you don't mean gabapentin, but you mean GABA as in a nutraceutical. Uh, and that can be quite helpful for people. That's often in a combination sleep formula, may have GABA, GABA 5-HTP, uh, as well as some of these other components. L-theanine is also quite good. It just comes from green tea. It helps with a sense of calm and mental clarity, L-theanine. Uh, so there's lots of different um, things to experiment with that are out there. Well, I wanna thank everyone for coming this evening. I hope you found it helpful. Um, feel free to um, look at the YouTube channel, share it with friends, uh, come to our next talks. We do this once a month. I try and bring guests in a few times a year as well. And so I look forward to having you next time, hopefully in person soon. All right, take good care.